My name is Melanie Bolli. I'm a neuroscientist and neurologist. Yeah. So what we do is, in the laboratory there are two main topics, as the title of the lab is saying. And there are lots of uh, experiments in humans and animals about the functions of sleep. And we also uh, work on neural collets of consciousness and also on uh, finding mechanisms more like a theoretical approach. It's all um, work in progress, but um, Giulio Tononi and Chiara Tirelli in Wisconsin, they have a very promising theory called the synaptic homeostasis theory of sleep, yeah? Shy. And this um, hypothesis says that actually we need to sleep in order to be able still to learn during wakefulness. Because what happens during wakefulness is that we are constantly exposed to new situations and we learn all the time. And we mainly learn by strength, strengthening connections, making connections, synapses stronger. Uh, in the brain. But then you cannot do that continuously without a renormalizing process because if you were uh, like making the connection stronger all the time then you increase the energy consumption, you even increase the volume of the brain and that's not sustainable because then your brain will explode and then you, you just cannot hold that, right? So their hypothesis is that sleep is um, that particular period of time that is crucial to renormalize, to decrease the weight of the synapses and uh, to, yeah, to downweight the synapses proportionally so that actually uh, in the morning when we wake up we're again ready to learn. As I said, there are different theories of sleep and this one is a very promising one but they are still testing it experimentally although there is a lot of data to support it now. So they have done experiments in animals looking at the strength and the number of synapses showing that you have more synapses than when you go to sleep and than when you wake up in the morning, right? But then uh, what they try to do is to try to also find a way to improve the quality and the, like if you want the, the efficiency of sleep. Like um, they think that slow waves, the, the electroencephalography big slow waves we have during sleep are involved in that plasticity process. And they are investigating if, uh, if you induce slow waves with sounds, for example, in human subjects, you can increase the efficiency of sleep, and then you would need to sleep less, yeah? I guess my biggest surprise was, I'm working since 11 years in vegetative state patients, yeah? And uh, these patients have the eyes open, but um, they don't show any signs of consciousness. I think my biggest surprise working in the field was that experiment with this with, with Adrian Owen, who was before in Cambridge, now is in Canada. And so we designed a paradigm together to try to detect consciousness in patients that cannot move. Yeah? And so what you do is you ask them to imagine some things, like imagine playing tennis while they are in the scanner and you record their brain activity. And personally, I designed a paradigm, but I, I never thought it would work, right? Because I thought, well, these patients, they don't move, they, they, you know, maybe they're, they're, they're just too weak to, to have some kind of high, you know, like very abstract uh, response to command. But actually it works in one out of 10 patients maybe, but they do, yeah, it, it, it is really useful. And that was actually a very big surprise for me. It tells you a lot about the dissociation between behavior and actually what someone can experience. Because the patients we have that respond to, like we, that do imagine playing tennis, they, they show activation of the motor cortex when we ask them. At the bedside, you don't, you don't see any behavior. So that tells you a lot about the difficulties of assessing consciousness clinically, and also how, like for dreams, yeah? Like how from the outside, someone can be no sign of consciousness, completely asleep or unresponsive, and then still a lot is going on. I think it's very striking, yeah.